Okay, Trevor. We have one Kyle who um, will be here. He called me. He's just running. All right. I know we were all excited uh, for this guest speaker, and we were able to move around uh, some of our things. So if we can, from this point forward, everyone, so that I don't have to change around seats, right, Harry? Okay. From this point forward, let's conduct ourselves uh, the way that you know how to conduct yourselves. Remember, this is your business people. You get the opportunity to listen to someone who has a wealth of knowledge to share with you and a great story and a lot of information. So I know you're all prepared questions and I know you're all going to uh, listen and make sure you get out of this. You know, again, this is about time. I tell you all the time that you have great people that are willing to give their time to come and talk to you because they're excited to value the opportunity as much as you are. Use this time wisely. This is a great benefit to you. So with that, we've spoken uh, briefly a few times regarding Mr. Feldman, and um, he's going to go into detail everything uh, from his background. But as you know, he is uh, here to talk about our uh, franchise-based businesses and his business of choice for that, well, the main business would be the Subway franchises. I know there's a few others that you may go over with them. And this is a great opportunity to uh, listen to and ask questions of someone who's a great entrepreneur and a, uh, a, and a great community person. So with that, Mr. Feldman, please, you. welcome. Appreciate Thank it. you very much. Thank you all. Is it Harry? Yes. Harry, you, is that your Subway Cup? Yes. You're the man. <laughs> You're the man. Great start, Harry. Um, really, thank you so much. You know, when uh, Beth called and told me about uh, the program, I could not be more excited. I wish there was a program like this that existed when I was growing up a long, long, long time ago. Um, uh, we used to have, uh, it was an insurance boy or an accountant, a hairdresser, whatever you wanted to be, they put out these books and they told you a little bit about the occupation, what they do, how, how it, um, what the schooling, the training that they needed to do. And that's about as far as we got when I was your age. It wasn't even, I'm not sure, I'm sure the word existed in the dictionary, but you really didn't hear the word entrepreneur back in the day. So I'm not even going to tell you how old I am, but it was a long, long time ago. So the opportunity to hear from uh, other business people, to learn about different sides of the business world, very exciting. But let me start off with the first question is, how many of you are entrepreneurs? How many of you are bankers? Huh? Huh? You almost got a hand there. No. Huh? No? Okay. Because the reason I asked this question um, and wanted to be a banker doesn't make you a bad person. Um, we need those banks to keep us funded, to keep the entrepreneur's dream alive. But the reality is, is that to be an entrepreneur is someone that basically takes for the most part, takes their whatever they can save, whatever their families can put in, whether it's taking your credit cards and charging them to the max, doing what you need to do because you have a dream, because you came up with a concept that you believe if this was out there, this could make a change 
may not change the world, but can make a change. And that's what the difference is for an entrepreneur. Um, you know, a, a long time ago, there was a, uh, uh, a great story about, um, and you probably, then you, I know you heard it as a kid, but used to take strands of gold. Um, we are the modern day alchemist. An alchemist is someone that takes ba base metals back in the day and tried to turn them into gold. What we do is we don't take base metal. What we do is we take our ideas and we try to turn them into gold. I know how intense your program has been. This is 33 weeks, a real opportunity for you to take a concept and really go with it. Interesting, when I was uh, talking to Beth, she had mentioned a couple of the programs, a couple of the ideas that you as entrepreneurs had come up with. Um, and each of those ideas sounded interesting in themselves. But now, once you have the idea, now it's about trying to figure out what you do with that idea, do with that concept. Now, I want you to picture this. 17-year-old young man, not much older than you guys, 17 years old needed to raise money to go to college, went to a family friend and said, I'd like to borrow money so that I can go to college. The family friend quite wisely said, um, no, I won't give you money to go to college, but I'll loan you money to start a business so that you can make money to go to college. There's another old expression that says, um, teach a man to fish rather than giving him fish. Because once he knows how to fish, he can always fish for himself and always take care of himself. If you give it to him once, then all he's got is that. So he's a 17-year-old guy who went to a family friend, borrowed $1,000. They said, well, okay, I'll start a business. What kind of business should we start? And they talked about it for a while, and this guy always thought about um, food comes from a nice Italian family and thought about it. We're always sitting around and food is important. 17 years old, took that $1,000 and opened up the first of Subways. That's how Subway started. He was 17 years old, didn't know anything about sandwich making, but thought that he could make a difference. And back in the day, there weren't a lot of what then were called hobies or subs, um, you know, it wasn't a big uh, part of our diet, now we know it is, but the bottom line is he borrowed that $17,000 and he opened up that first store. And they opened up that first store and said, well, we think this is a good concept and we probably can open another one, why don't we give that a try? He opened up the next one. And then from there, started to grow through franchising which I'll be talking about in a minute. But now, Subway has become the largest food outlet in the world. We now have more units in the United States than McDonald's. We have about 36,000 stores, and we continue to open every day in 87 countries and continue to grow. So from a simple young man from Bridgeport, Connecticut, not having all kinds of dollars, borrowing, and he borrowed $1,000, both he and the gentleman that loaned him that $1,000, his name is Peter Buck, Fred DeLuca is the gentleman who uh, started Subway, but Peter Buck, who was a family friend who loaned him that $1,000, they are both now listed on the Forbes Richest American List, each about one, uh, uh, number 176. So again, as you're sitting here in the class, Think about what you're doing and think about what it could mean for you in your future. Now, that's when you start a concept and you have some choices. When you start a business and you think it's a good business, you can open up that business and you open up your first store. You see how that's doing or whatever the business may be. Maybe a store may not be, but you open up that first one. Then you decide if that's going is doing well and you want to increase that business, then you might want to open up a second one. And then maybe even a third. Now, the thing to remember when you open up your own individual businesses is that generally, 
you need to be there or at least have a significant role in the operation of those individual businesses. However, there's an alternative. The alternative is called franchising. And in franchising, you basically take that individual concept, but now you basically, for lack of a better term, and I'll explain a little bit more in a minute, you basically sell that concept to individuals who now take that concept and open up additional units. What happens is, is that that pays you either a franchise fee, which is a basic fee for the right to open your business in another location, and then ongoing royalties. Ongoing royalties are basically the right for you to use that concept. So what happens is, when you think about it, and whatever your moms and dads do when they work, um, they're out there and they put in certain number of hours, and they're paid for their time. So they're limited by how much they can do by their time. In a franchise concept, if you're the franchisor, if you own that franchise concept, you get the opportunity to multiply the benefits of that individual store or that individual business time and time and time again. So in my original example with Fred DeLuca, the guy who started Subway, he could have opened up that third store, that fourth store, and then be running back and forth and trying to make sure that the store is operating properly and doing all those things. Or after a point, and this is what he does, that this is what he did over 40 years ago, he decided to franchise that business. And now, as I mentioned before, we're at over 30, uh, latest count is somewhere around 36,000 stores. And what happens is he gets a piece of everybody's business in terms of royalties because he thought of the idea and the concept and he created a program that allows whoever gets into franchising to do that business. So when we look at different businesses and we do an analysis, and I know some of you are doing projects that may be franchisable, um, we basically look at four things. We look at the product itself. We make sure that the product, and we have an expression about being a better mousetrap. It may be something that already exists, but there may be a better way that you discover to make it happen, or it may be a concept that's not out there. For instance, can I talk about the, you had mentioned a couple of the projects. Sure, you can talk about, can you can I, ask them, you can you, talk about whatever you'd I like to. I don't know they're, if the projects were secret. They're not or, shy. No, they okay. know as long as they've they given know. the idea in this class, it's their idea. Okay. So it's one of the ideas open. I heard um, that I took the liberty of mentioning to my friends and uh, some of my relatives who are in business was um, a uh, computer uh, tutoring program that for would, senior citizens. That's Sam. Absolutely, anyone I tell, <laughs> What a great idea. As a senior citizen, I gotta tell you, I love you. Um, but there's a concept. Now let's say you opened that first one up and it was a great success and you opened it up in Boca Raton, Florida. And then one of your cousins came from California and said, what a great idea. Let's open one of these in California. And you say, listen, I don't know about running back and forth to California and Arizona and here and there. I know it's a great concept. So what I'm willing to do is I'm willing to franchise, allow you to franchise, but basically license the concept, if that's easier to, to conceive. Um, and you take uh, that business that has these four categories. So as you, those of you that are looking to do franchising, or even the business itself, ask you if it has these components, ask yourself if it has these components. First one, again, product. Great product, Sam. Uh, great idea, great concept. Or we can talk about Subway. Not a lot of sandwich shops back in the day, um, a mom and pops, but certainly not an organized uh, sandwich concept. So when you can go from one state to another, again, this goes back over 40 years ago, you go from one state to another, you know the product that you're getting, the quality, the pricing, all of those things. So you look at the product and you say, this is a product that's gonna make a difference. Product, simplicity of operation. Particularly in franchising, if you're going to have someone else do what you do best, 
I mean, one of the main reasons why you're probably successful, if you go into the, um, a business and open up either a retail operation or whatever it may be, you have a belief. You feel it inside, you are going to happen. And when I asked you to raise your hands at the beginning about those of you that are franchise, uh, 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 interested in franchises rather than banking, is that you need to be able as a franchisee to basically go to sleep at night. <coughs> and I lecture uh, next door as well to MBAs and I tell them the same thing. Can you sleep at night betting the family farm, betting all of your savings, betting on an idea, basically because you're saying to yourself, I don't want to live my life saying I should have, would have, could have. I had this great idea and I never went ahead and I was afraid and I didn't take the chance. These are some of the things that if I had the opportunity to learn at your age and thinking about that process, that I have a product that's going to make a difference, that I can make it simple so that I can pass this on to someone else to take the concept and now multiply it. And what do I get in return? Well, my cousin, who now opened up the same concept, is now going to be paying me, not only for me to have developed the concept, but will be paying me ongoing royalties for the use of the concept based on um, volume. There are different ways to base it, but based on the number of customers, clients, whatever it may be, he pays you a piece of that. So we have product. We have simplicity of operation. We have control. Control these days is more important than anything else. Control makes the difference between success and failure in your business. Make sure that you understand if it's food, what your food costs are. If it's product, what those product costs are. Not only the cost of the product itself, but also in terms of your labor. Those are the two most important things as you develop a business that you need to be concerned about. So you have product, simplicity, control. You also need to know, one of the reasons why Subway has a 99% success rate, or a 99% success rate, is because the controls and the checks and balances are there. When you go into your local Subway, we know at the end of the day, or at the most, at the end of the week, exactly what your food costs are, exactly what your labor costs are. So we can now know at the end of the day, or at the most at the end of the week, if your food costs or your labor costs are out of whack, you're losing money, it's too expensive, now six months or a year down the road, your accountant calls and says, you know, your food costs are way out of whack. Well, you say, thank you very much, it's a year later, now what do I do with that information? As opposed to knowing then and there how to make the corrections. I literally can take a look at, you guys all come in if you order a tuna sub, I can take a look and I can see, based on the number of tuna subs that we sold, I can tell that there's either too little or too much tuna being used at the end of the week. Not at the end of the quarter, not at the end of the year. So what happens is I go back and I take a look at our uh, sandwich artists and I see that instead of leveling out a measured tuna scoop, they shoveled it out. New employee thinks you're doing a great job, want to give you as much as possible, shoveling out that tuna, putting it in the sandwich, but now what happens is, is that I see that our food costs that week are out of whack with the number of sandwiches that we actually sold. So by having that kind of control, that product, that simplicity of operation, those controls, we're able to get that kind of success rate because you're not left there on your own. And that brings, us, brings me to the fourth point, which is critically important, which is support. If you open, for lack of a better term, a mom and pop business, one that you're opening up and it's a single store operation, who's there to support you? Who's there to work with you in terms of your costs, your operations? If your costs are out of whack, who teaches you to get back in control? Who teaches you about banking? Marketing, just about every time you turn on the television, I would be surprised if you didn't see a subway commercial. We have over an $800 million, almost a billion dollar advertising budget. That allows us to work with athletes, to work with associations, to have TV commercials um, all over the place, to do sponsorship of events. 
that allows us to send the word out. So every franchisee in the system puts a percentage in for advertising. So now we have professionals who are helping us to maximize the message in a mom and pop that may not exist. So product, simplicity, control, and support. Whenever you're doing your projects, regardless of whether it's franchising or this is about a business that you want to open for yourself, just make sure that you can meet the, that criteria so that you understand that you have, once you open a business with a concept, now you know how to protect it. Um, as I went through this process myself very many years ago, um, I, was, uh, I grew up in the projects of Brooklyn. Um, I went to college and then I went to law school. The interesting thing for me was that while I was in the school of business as a freshman, I really didn't like studying business. I like doing business. Um, I ultimately uh, changed my major, became a political science major, went to law school. Um, from law school, I became a minority counsel on the House Banking Committee with the House of Representatives, the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, and while I was on the Hill in Washington, uh, in Congress, there was a location directly across the street from the House of Representatives. I had 14,000 congressional employees across the street who were eating what we call institutional food. Um, it's food that you get um, before they were brand name products. Um, you go to university, you go to hospitals, you go wherever it is, and you just get a general kind of food, whatever it may be. Um, now we had an opportunity to bring Subway to the Washington area. And with a congressman as a partner, um, I opened up the first Subway in the Washington area, um, directly across the street from the House of Representatives. But as we looked at the analysis, all of the things that I'm talking to you today, and I've been in this business 35 years now, all of the things that I'm talking to you uh, about today, all the things that we looked at to decide if we wanted to get into Subway. So, I used to do congressional hearings in the morning, and I don't know if, the, if you have the opportunity to see some of the hearings, see the congressmen and the senators that are up there, and you see a young staffer whispering their, in their ear about uh, the bill or the legislation that they're working on. That's what I used to do. And I used to then run across the street at 12 o'clock, take off my jacket, put on my apron, start making sandwiches behind the counter, and all the people that worked on the hill would come and look at me funny and say, you look very familiar. <laughs> After lunch, take my apron off, put my jacket on, and go back and do it. And so I did that with that first store. Then I opened another one at Andrews Air Force Base, another one at University of Virginia, and at some point I said, I want to run my own business. I want to be an entrepreneur. And I went to Fred DeLuca that I went to college with. Fred DeLuca who started Subway. We went to college together. And I said, Fred, I can't really work for you as an employee, but what do you think about creating an entrepreneurial opportunity? And we developed what's called the development agent concept. And a development agent basically owns a territory and has a right to either open up their own stores in the territory or to franchise that territory out. My first territory, Washington, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware, we currently are approaching the 1,200 store number. Um, last year, I bought South Florida, where we have 250 stores open. I bought that in March of this year, and by March of 2012, one year later, we will have added 40 stores to this area I'll open about uh, 80 or 90 in the Washington metropolitan area. The beauty of that is that there's a multiplication of income. There I have 1,200 stores. Here I have 250, soon to be 300 stores. Each of those stores pays a royalty. So the opportunity, as I mentioned before, about you being able to multiply your income. So it's just a different way for you to look at the business side. Now the beauty of franchising, as opposed to the business side, and I gave you product simplicity, control, and support, and when you look at the numbers, 
about the success rate of independent businesses versus franchises, over 80%, we'll use restaurants as an example, over 80% of small business restaurants close within their first three years of operation. With franchises, those numbers are exactly reversed. Over 80% succeed when they're involved in a franchise concept. So it's about all that support, that training, the ongoing um, marketing. So as you put your programs together, incorporate all of these individual things into your program. Now, the one thing you need to know, if you're an entrepreneur, that's the way we started as an entrepreneur, is are you ready to make that risk? Are you ready to take that sacrifice? You need to be really sure that this is something that is special to you, that you think can make a difference, and you need to be ready to make that sacrifice to make it happen. You probably will work harder as an entrepreneur, because with an entrepreneur, the clock never goes off. You're always thinking, how can I make it better? What things can I do? Where can I make changes that didn't exist before? So, as I have three sons who are now in their 20s. Um, all of them are entrepreneurial. Um, my middle son works with me in Subway. Um, my oldest son is a men's fashion designer, and my youngest son is his director of marketing. But it's about making that decision about whether or not you have something special that you want to create. Recently, there was an article that was done in uh, Boca Magazine about um, our family, and we are very blessed. And it's just an unbelievable situation. Um, again, particularly growing up in the projects of, uh, of Brooklyn, um, to now be here with you guys in Boca. Um, it's a very nice thing to do. Um, but we talk about, in that article, we talk about not having a J-O-B, as opposed to a labor of love. And that's what's really important. As you guys at this age, you have the opportunity to plan out kind of the direction that you'd like to, to head in. You'll make changes many, many times as you grow up. Opportunities will arise, things will happen. But if there's a basic business philosophy for you and in your hearts about whether it's about getting a J-O-B, and I spell it like that, a job, where you get up, you go to work, and you don't necessarily enjoy it. That's something that you have an opportunity here to make a commitment as you go on with your studies, as you go to college, the subjects that you do study. Um, and then as you move on after that, is this about getting a paycheck? Or is it about getting a paycheck, but also doing something that you really love? There's a big difference between the two. And that's why I was very excited to have the opportunity to come mention that to you guys. That it's so important as you move forward, and I know at this point there are other things that you're more serious about, but if you can just remember that, this is what I was hoping, and I was thinking about it this morning, if I would be able to have you 20 years from now remember any of the things that I said, and think about your life choices and the opportunity that you have, then I would have been successful. I could talk about business plans, business systems, and we can, we're gonna set some time so we can have some questions and talk about your plans and what you're doing there. But this is really about feeling inside that you have a sense of control. You have a desire to be successful or you wouldn't be in this class. Just what you did to get into this program, just that you're dedicating your time for 33 weeks and the opportunity that you may have at the end of this, imagine as you go on to other competition with your uh, programs and imagine other business people take a look at your plan and they're ready to invest in your business at your age. This is a huge, exciting opportunity for you. So, I just want to open this up for questions, we can talk about franchising, we can talk about all kinds of different things, we can talk about your program. 
Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was I chose the law school route. I chose to go to law school. For me, it was a great decision. I loved law school. I loved learning about the law. But what I found was, particularly in business, I can apply the law every day. I use it all the time. Now, that does not mean that getting your uh, business degree, moving on for an MBA, or moving on from there, it just is a different route. There are different ways to do it. Also, many of you may be more analytical. You may like the number side. You may like that crunching um, and doing that. So you come at the business just from a different way. Others come from a marketing perspective. My son, who's our uh, vice president of marketing, has now brought us the new way that you guys know. When I was growing up, no computers, none of the things that you guys have now. Now you have an opportunity to take the new technology and make a difference as well. So, a lot of things for us to talk about, um, but again, I gotta tell you, could not be more proud uh, of this class and you guys for what you do. So, let's open it up to questions. I just want, you know, before we get started, I want everybody to, uh, to realize, I hope you're all noticing, you know, whether it's been myself or some of the other entrepreneurs or Mr. Feldman, some consistent things that keep coming up. And one of those main things that we talked about in our first class is that passion. Having, you know, not only having an idea, because you have to separate the business ideas from business opportunities, and it helps a lot if you have a passion and you believe in what you're trying to accomplish. So. Uh, in, in, in the context of those things, I think, you know, again, whatever questions you have, now's the opportunity. So who would like to start it out? What is it that I didn't like about studying business? For me, the, the study of business was uh, more about the theory. Um, it was more about the number crunching, um, which for me, me personally. Again, I'm more an idea person. Even now, I have a director of operations, and that person um, is responsible with his team for going in and doing the number crunching and looking at that. Whereas I, for instance, I just came from touring uh, stores, and for me, I walk into the store to me about what we can do in terms of customer service, what we can do about the look of the stores. And for me, it's not about counting the money, it's about making it. Um, so it just was a little dry for me, but business schools are packed, so somebody's doing it. Joey, you know, if you could, if you tell Mr. Feldman what your business idea is, because you're on the creative side of things. Um, my business idea is um, a She identified that you know a lot of parents were coming to her and saying you know we're so, we're missing things that are happening whether it's at a party or a sporting event and she said well you know, that's something that I, I, I enjoy photography anyway so great next question let's go with uh, Harry why don't you stand up and say who you are and what your concept because we have both social and business on the um, I'm Harry and what's your biggest weakness in subway like what do you see the biggest biggest weaknesses? Oh, great question. Um, the difference between being in franchising and owning a business, and I teach my people as much as possible, we need to sell, not tell. When you have a franchise and you have a concept, you want to be able to sell your franchisees on the concept that it's the right thing to do. If you own a business, then you walk in and you say to your employees, this is the way it's going to be, let's make it happen this way. With franchising, there's a frustration because not everybody comes to the franchise world um, with the same skill set, knowledge base. Um, a lot of people will think about getting into Subway as buying a job um, they're buying a store, whereas their real business is customer service. You take care of your customers, you love your customers, you do the right thing, you make sure that your restaurant is always clean, 
your uh, uh, sandwich artists are always in clean uniforms and looking good. And Harry, when you come into my store, I'm going to say to you, hey, this is your third time this week. Should I make you your regular? Now, imagine if you knew that you had people there that were doing this kind of thing that made a difference in your experience. So the hardest part for me as a franchisor is getting other people to understand what our main concept is, as opposed to someone who just opens up the door and opens up a restaurant. So it's a great question, but as a franchisor, the hardest thing is to get all the franchisees to be as good as they can be. Harry, why don't you? Um, my business is where I sell crayons to restaurants, because restaurants usually pay for brand new crayons, and then after a kid uses them once, then they just throw them out, even though they're totally usable. So what I started with is I would gather up all the used crayons in a month from a restaurant and I would donate them to kids in Haiti who've never seen colors and could never draw. And right now I'm expanding on that and I'm gonna be buying crayons in bulk very cheaply and I'm gonna sell them like cheaper than what restaurants usually pay for their normal crayons. And the reason I'm selling it cheaper is because I know that they're gonna be giving them back to me so I can give them to the Haitians. Um, but the main point is that since I'm a nonprofit organization, even though I'm still making like a little money, um, they're gonna be, it's basically free crayons because all the money that they put into buying the crayons gets reducted on their income tax. Very good, yeah. great idea. That's awesome. Right, you had a question? Very nice. Stand up, Rebecca, we need to see you. Introduce yourself. Hi. I'm Rebecca, and I wanted to know um, what advice would you give to someone who uh, was just uh, with them? what advice would you give to someone who is just starting out a business with a limited fund but a big idea? Yeah, the key question. That is the number one question, and the hardest part, um, particularly at the beginning of what we do, is trying to sell others on the concept so that we can get the money that we need to do it. That is the number one problem, particularly um, when we go to see the banks. Now, the banks are more difficult now than they ever were. Back in the, let's say, the 80s, um, uh, we had what we called the go-go years. That was a time when I literally could walk into a banker, um, basically give them what was a good idea, and for not much more than my signature, um, maybe a little collateral, I could borrow. Now it is incredibly difficult for banks to borrow money. So when you have an idea and now you have to sell it to the bank, um, now, I want you to keep in mind here, and I have a little, um, a little bit of a bent away from the bank, because now we're giving a proposal to an individual who's sitting behind his desk and he's now judging whether or not he thinks this concept will be something that will go. In your heart, you know this is absolutely awesome. And who is this guy to tell you that he can or can't? Um, and we had this problem in the early days with Subway. We go in to borrow money and they say, Subway, what's, what's Subway? Bless you. They'd say, what's Subway? And um, they'd say, you know, we'd say, we'd like to borrow, let's say, $100,000. Um, and all of a sudden, this junior loan officer would say to himself, well, if I make this loan to Subway, and the Subway goes out of business, then we have this all the stainless steel equipment, refrigeration, freezers, all of these things, and I know that I can only get 10 or 15 cents on the dollar, and then my boss will be mad at me if this concept doesn't happen, I'm lending the money. So there's that kind of conservatism, but then you hear about, I'll give you one of my stories, and I'll get you, give you one of the, uh, the um, uh, gentleman who created um, FedEx, Mr. Smith, um, he literally was down to his last payroll, and he went to Vegas, to Las Vegas, and he had, he bet money to make money to make his payroll. And he made his payroll, and now we all know the FedEx story. I got one of those as well. I was down to my last payroll. I went to my stockbroker. I said to my stockbroker, we have 60 days to make enough money for me to keep this business going. 
and I'm giving you my life savings, and I want you to multiply this. Well, I didn't find out till later that he was a nervous wreck for 60 days. <laughs> I knew in my heart of hearts as the sacrifice that you make and the thoughts as you go through the process, because as an entrepreneur, you're gonna have people say, oh, that's a crazy idea, that'll never work, da 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 You need to take that, process it, and then if you believe you need to go for it, and it's the same thing whether you're talking to banker one or banker 50, you need to go through that process. It may be that your credit cards, there are a lot of stories about entrepreneurs that maxed out their cre credit cards just so they can have enough to show the world that they have a great concept. If they would not have taken the risk, many of them would have gotten a J-O-B and maybe have spent all or a significant part of their life saying, I should have, would have, could have. So it is the hardest part of what we do as entrepreneurs. Maybe we need to fine tune our plan more. Maybe we need to ask those that are not willing to give us to say, well, what did you see in the plan that you think could be stronger? What was missing? What would you like to see? Um, many of us have gone to our relatives and said, I, I need to borrow, even if it's small pieces, and I'll pay you back. It is full, uh, business history is full of those stories. What's also amazing is the famous, so many famous people that you know that have gone bankrupt. Thomas Edison. He was bankrupt and his patents failed more than they were successful. But we know them for his success. There are so many of those kinds of stories. Believe and create. That's what this is about. Can you, 30 second elevator? Yes. <laughs> 30 seconds, Rebecca. I'm saying specifically 30 seconds. You got it, you're on, kid. Positive pocket, I created in response to a bullying incident. And I found my inner strength and my self-confidence through a, um, a little card I made with positive sayings. And I created this saying, keeping your thoughts in your pocket wherever you go. And it was so, um, like, the idea was revealed to like, all my friends and family, and they loved it so much that, it, that we had to get it professionally printed. And um, we developed a website so people can order them. And I now speak uh, to different events, like working with kids and stuff. And then um, we're currently an LLC, but we want to um, get a 501c3 so that I can start a scholarship for kids with good character. And po what uh, Positive Pocket is a metaphor for holding on to something special that you can keep with you. That the, the pocket is the metaphor. So. Awesome. Great programs. This is great. Let's go. Who has the next question? And let me just mention I ran into someone recently. Um, we go up to, to Vail to ski, and I ran into a young lady who has a marketing program. Um, thank you. Awesome. Um, and um, she was sitting around one day and she was saying, why can't we just be good to people? Mm -hmm. And she started a whole line from that thought. She started a whole line of mugs, shirts, um, and it just says, be good to people. I saw that. I bought it for my whole staff. We ordered about 150 of these mugs and yoga mats and shirts and all kinds of things. But just from that simple concept, she's got a huge business. And it's about being sending but the right message. Yeah, but it's not just for like people who are bullied, it's for anyone. Gotcha. Like no, that's why. Be good to people is for everyone. This is awesome. Oh, awesome. I can't wait to look through these. These are beautiful. Congratulations. Any other questions? Jessica? You've got a real interesting concept that you might be able to franchise someday. So would you just tell Mr. Feldman um, what what your business is? My business is an online tutoring. It's math right now, but it could eventually expand. And it's kids teaching other kids because some kids are intimidated by adults. And the kids that are working and tutoring, they can get paid, but they can also do community service. And then the money they would have earned 
that money then gets donated to kids related charities. Awesome. Great program. I like the charities at the end. That's a great thing. Awesome. Anyone else? Yeah. Any questions about Subway itself, the operation, um, thoughts, anything like that? Yes. When you were planning to open your first location for Subway on Capitol Hill, what opportunities did you anticipate aside from knowing there would be a busy flow of people? And what, if any, potential threats or setbacks did you face? Good question. Good question. Um, and for me, I, as someone who went to Pete Subs back in the day, I was a customer of uh, the predecessor to Subway. Um, I just knew as much as I could know. Again, taking the family farm, which is basically the euphemism for all the money I had, um, and putting that up. And I just knew that um, once we opened up that business, that it would be busy. But I'll tell you, nothing is scarier than standing behind the counter, looking out the window waiting for those customers to come in. So that's the a, a difficult su uh, part of it, that very beginning. What was the, the second part of your question? Um, what, if any, potential threats or setbacks did you face? Oh, boy. Well, we started out with the construction. Um, this is a building across from the House of Representatives, if any of you have been in Washington. Um, it's directly across from the House of Representatives. The building was 100 years old. So we started out, every time we hit a brick, another brick fell out. <laughs> so we started out budget. The budget got whacked very early on. Um, you know, you need a lot of crystal ball for your budgets as well, um, uh, because you're never quite sure. Chances are you won't have enough. One of the things to think about is never go into a business undercapitalized. Don't go into this thinking, well, I'll make it my first week or two and then I'll spend the money. Make sure that you have a cushion. Make sure that you have an advertising and marketing fund so that you have the ability to multiply your business. Because a lot of people make that mistake. And I did the same thing. As an entrepreneur just starting out, you can only get so much. And once you get that amount, you build out the store and then you do a lot of praying. But more failure comes from being undercapitalized than just about anything else. So we had all kinds of challenges as well as we were the first one in the Washington area. Um, nobody really knew about something. So we had to market it. We had to get out there. We had to do taste tests, let people experience the product, come up with all kinds of innovative marketing ideas. Don't forget, this is now Subway when there are only a couple of Subways out. Now everybody knows uh, what they are. But you can expect all of those challenges as you do your business. Yes? Um, curious about franchising. Is communication with the same people that you send royalties to like an important part of your job? Very much so. And that's why the fourth category, product simplicity, control, support, they, every franchisee gets visited by an operations analyst. An operations analyst, their job is to make sure that each individual location is not only doing their business properly, but they're maximizing their profitability. So not only do we have that communications when they're visited, at least every month we do a full computerized evaluation, a very thick wow. evaluation, that they get back the reports, they know how to improve, they know if they're out of compliance, that they need to get back into compliance immediately, um, as well as newsletters, calls, meetings, it is critically important that we come off as a team and that all the Subway franchisees, and that's the hardest challenge for me because not everybody's the same, so you deal with different skill sets and different abilities, um, but bottom line is we want you to be able to go into a Subway, uh, whether it's on Glades Road or whether it's East or wherever it may be, and get the same experience. So that's the hardest part, but communications is the key to uh, Harry, let me just, I'm sorry. What's oh, wait, wait, if I may, what's your project? Um, basically, I seek out talent at a local level, and I like sell pre-sales. Um, I produce t-shirts, and I basically like get publicity for the bands I work with. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That's, 
my son, the fashion, the men's fashion designer. Oh, yeah. Um, and kind of got there that way. He was uh, on Warp Tour. He was a musician. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was uh, on Warp Tour. He was a musician. Um, got his degree in audio engineering and entertainment business. Got a job with a, an agent, um, the agency that represents Nickelback and a lot of other groups, um, and decided that he just didn't want to sit behind the screen doing contracts and counting tickets. Um, was always kind of into fashion, went to Parsons in New York, got his degree, um, and started interning. Very important, boy, I'm, I'm glad I just thought of that word. Whenever you can, intern. It is the best thing that you can be. Not only do you learn on someone else's dime, you learn the successes and failures that that business may have, you learn that business, but you also get an opportunity to test out some of your ideas, to give some thoughts there, so wherever you can. And that's what he did. He interned for some um, top designers, um, and now has started his own fashion line. So, a little securitous, securitous word. That's an interesting um, change. But, good concept, I'm sorry. What's, what's the next next big step that Subway's gonna take? Um, good question, you all know Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, Jared is now celebrating his 10th anniversary <laughs> with us. By the way, Jared is a real person. Um, Jared went to Indiana State University, was very obese. His father was a pediatrician, and they used to fight all the time about his weight. At some point, he finally could not get into an airplane seat. Um, and that was kind of the most telling moment. By fate, he ended up renting an apartment while he was going to Indiana State University above a subway. Literally, his apartment was above the subway. And he created this program, this real story, where for lunch, he would have a um, six inch cold cut combo. Uh, the cold cut combo are uh, turkey based meats as opposed to beef. Um, a uh, baked lays, I see Harry's bag, baked lays, and a Diet Coke. For dinner, he would have a foot-long veggie, um, a baked lays, and a Diet Coke. And he would walk every night. And the weight started to come off. We literally have hundreds of thousands of people in Jared's army. Um, as you know, if you, were, if you watch The Biggest Loser or you see any of the health programs, we were just named the number one place to eat in men's health magazine. Um, so some of the things that we do, we originally started out as a sub place, and back in the day, it used to be when you get these big greasy subs, and gradually what ha has happened is, we happened is we've gotten more into health message, um, more about weight issues, there's a concern about diabetes and obesity and all of these things, so we're always looking at, we reduced our sodium intake, um, we reduced um, the calories, uh, our breads are more healthy, uh, dark bread. So everything's kind of moving more to the health and weight issue. However, when you think about it, there's never been a um, health food, fast food restaurant concept that's ever been successful. It's interesting. Americans talk about being health conscious, but when it comes down to it, you have more hamburger and steak places in Boca Raton than probably anywhere else. Um, so, um, we're constantly looking for the next message. You'll see local sandwiches, you'll see um, on, on TV, we just recently, uh, within the last year and a half, did breakfast. Mm -hmm. Breakfast opened up an entire new area for us. Um, the store was already there. The store was not producing any income between 8 and 10 o'clock in the morning. Now we have a whole separate business where not only do they buy breakfast sandwiches, but they also buy lunch sandwiches that they take to the office as well. So we have had a huge increase in our business. So right now it's about um, staying within the health message, but we never know what the next thing will be. Your project? What's your project? I don't have one. <gasps> He's still working on it. We also have some people that are partnering <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, hold it one second. Yes. Um, 
when you say like healthy fast food, like I don't understand what that means. Like, okay, I'll give you an example. When you go into our store, and now you're going to see it in um, particularly fast food restaurants more and more, but particularly fast food, it's starting to be mandated by the cities and the states, pretty soon the federal government, um, where you demonstrate and you display calories, fat intake, sodium intake, so that now you're able to make a more informed choice when you're gonna buy your lunch, and you take a look and you say, well, you know, I can have a, um, a BMT, which is um, our big cold cut sandwich, and that may have, let's use 350 calories. Or you can have turkey um, with uh, mustard instead of mayonnaise, put your veggies on, and you can walk out of there at 150 calories. You know, part of our programming is we have uh, uh, seven sandwiches under seven, six grams of fat. So you're always looking to make a more informed choice. Um, if you want to get that big, Greasy sub, we are there, uh, we call them indulgent subs. You want to get a steak and cheese, we're there for you. <laughs> but if you have some concerns and you want to say, you know what, I had my pizza, I had my hamburgers, I had this, well, now yeah, I'm going to have a turkey, pizza. you're doing whatever, say again? You guys sell pizza as well. And we have pizza as yeah. well, so that's, but that's a choice. We're giving those choices, but basically the, the bottom line is staying in a healthier product choice. But what's your difference from like Chipotle? Just, uh, you know, Chipotle is all Mexican. Their thing as well is a healthier product um, and they use fresh. Yeah. Uh, it's all about fresh, as with us. So it's just a different taste profile. Um, but even Chipotle, uh, I'm not sure if they post now, but yeah. the government, they do post? Yeah, they do. Yeah, so everyone is now starting to post so you can make better decisions. Yeah, and like what I like about Subway, it's like I go there a lot, like every day. Thank you. Good. I was gonna my say. children, thank you. My wife, thank you. Like, um, what I like is like they always have like my mom. She's like very like, like she always chooses like healthy stuff for me, it's, like the family and stuff. And whenever we go there, she likes looking at the cup and like the napkins and like the wrapping. Yep. And she's all there. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank mom. <laughs> Who's next? Uh, let's Zach. go with uh, Zach. Um, when do you know when to franchise or expand? Ah, great question. When do you know when to franchise and expand? If indeed, and um, as a matter of fact, we're going through this process now. Um, a friend of mine that was involved um, in Subway and continues to be, and has just purchased multiple units, but has also just started a delicatessen down in Palomino Palmetto. It's called Zingers. It's a new uh, a deli, great, a great place. Um, they open up their first one, and they're asking themselves the same question. For instance, Aventura, they believe, could be a great place for this kind of Boca-based delicacy. Um, so their question is, do we go and open an Aventura, a little bit of like the example we talked about, the cousin in, uh, in California, but do we now go and have to be responsible for the every minute operation of the unit, or is this something that is franchisable because it has that product simplicity control and support? And so now they're designing that restaurant with those four categories in mind so that when they are ready to expand, they say, we're doing great in Boca. This would be terrific. They're at that stage exactly now. So now what's happening is now they're creating the manuals so that the, that the simplicity of operation, the product, the controls, all of those things are going to be there as well, so that they'll be able to make that decision whether they want to be out there because, you know, there's one guy who's the manager of that, and then what happens when that one guy now has to be split between both and that and sure? You know, I have an expression, there's a difference between trying and doing. You don't want to try to be successful, you want to be successful. Um, interesting thing, just do me a favor for a second. Would everyone just stand up? Stand, stand down there, just be on top of your cushion. Okay? Come on. That's <laughs> yes, there. Okay? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. We're right. Right. Now everyone stand up. We're touching it, though. Now everyone sit down. Oh. Oh. Did you see Did how? You have, no, no, some I of us. Um, <laughs> um, 
The difference there was the difference between trying and doing. How hard it was to try to sit down and how easy it was. Once you decided in your mind to sit down, how easy it was, this is about life's lessons. You can try to do something, so when your, your mom or your dad or somebody says, do this, and you kind of give it kind of a halfway try, as opposed to, we're now decided to do it, that's what makes a difference. So whenever you can, get out there and do it. Don't try. It's an interesting okay? concept for, uh, for today, considering that it's a cut down day for, for businesses, and it comes down to, you know, the businesses that have put the most effort into it up to this point will be the ones moving on, and there'll be some others that don't. So, I want to tell them real quick what your concept is. Our business is the, have you ever watched the show Auction Hunters or like Story Wars? Sure. Um, you know how they buy the units and how it's like really inefficient? I want to buy the units in the inefficient market and make it more efficient online. And people can buy it anytime and they'll have a longer time to um, like, like dig it out and like get all the stuff out of there. Mm -hmm. Opposed to having like 48 hours, they'll have like three weeks. And also, when they're like, uh, when I'm auctioning it off online, there'll be like lights on the unit so they can see better. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and you mentioned about the storage units. I wanted to tell you also about, you know, you see those trucks got junk? Yeah. 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 Not great, a great, great story. Fun. There's a great story. I mean, the guy literally had a truck, yeah, a dump truck. I, uh, uh, it, was, it was a pickup truck. And he was driving around the neighborhoods and he was seeing this stuff that was out there. And he literally went, knocked on the door, and said, listen, we can pick this stuff up, we can get rid of it for you at a price. Um, and he started doing that, next thing you know, another truck, another truck. I know I use the service many times. It's a great service, but just from that simple idea, and then going out there and marketing it, he was just knocking on those doors, marketing it, it's amazing how this stuff happens. We have time for a few more, yeah. I know Danny, you had it. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what kind of other businesses you started. Okay, um, let's see, Subway was, my main uh, goal for a number of years. Um, I created also a company called Hair Color Experts. Hair Color Experts, this is, uh, my dad was a hairdresser. Um, I grew up in hair salons. And what I kept hearing about was as, and ladies here can tell us about this. Well, maybe well, me. Can, I don't think any of them can well, yet. I can probably uh, tell you I'm a little bit. I'm seeing a little <laughs> color here. Um, <laughs> But uh, the bottom line is, is we wanted to uh, provide affordable hair care for the masses, and for, uh, particularly affordable hair color. Now, I found out um, that uh, a lot of women don't tell their significant others even how much they spend because it's too expensive to do your hair in the, uh, in the salon. Some people would pay half in cash. They put credit card. <laughs> if my I mean, husband knew, I'd be like, we have and to put it in the family budget. For you the see? Month. And then the other side of that was also then if you go and you buy Clairol or any of the other colors and you do it at home, what happens is, is that you get um, dye on your tile, on your um, towels. It doesn't come out even. It doesn't look right. So we wanted to make it uh, a um, uh, affordable hair care, but also we did seven days a week, because if particularly the women who come to our business who are working moms, they wanted to have the opportunity to come in on a Sunday um, or late at night, opportunities for them to be comfortable at what they did. Then when a, a uh, client left, every woman left with a rose. So there she was feeling great, either she got her hair cut or colored, um, and it was for guys as well, but uh, mostly for, uh, for women. Um, and so every time they, they left, they got a rose showing appreciation um, for uh, uh, them, being a, them being a client of our operation. Um, on Sundays, we would literally have coaches from local high schools come in and do um, courses on football, on basketball, 
for the spouses. So that when they were sitting there with uh, their husbands or their significant others, they had an opportunity to all of a sudden, they knew what they were watching it was more of that. So instead of just sitting there under the dryer on, on a Sunday or whatever, they were now taking the next step and doing something else as well. Um, the concept was uh, very successful. We sold 200 franchises our first year in operation, um, and then I sold that concept. Because for me, it was more about the ideas, creating the ideas and making it happen. So uh, that was a business. Um, uh, and uh, had created that in about, uh, sold it in about four years. After that, I did something called um, Pizza Fusion. Mm -hmm. uh, pizza Fusion, organic pizzas. People got more concerned about vegetables fresh vegetables and pesticides. You know, when I was growing up, all our vegetables um, and fruits um, were very fresh. There were less pesticides being used. Now there's a tremendous amount of pesticides that are out there. Maybe responsible for increases in cancer, maybe responsible for other diseases. But the bottom line is, if you could get a fresh product, and as moms are more concerned about your health, you know, my kids were growing up, they decided where we eat based on what the toy was. Um, mm -hmm. Now, moms are more educated, um, and even you're more educated, in that you want to be strong, you want to feel good, and you want to be active. So we created um, Pizza Fusion, which is uh, still in existence now. Um, and this was started uh, by two young guys um, who had that idea about serving a better, healthier product. And I found that concept and uh, worked, uh, worked on that. We just uh, created the Zingers, this deli. So as an entrepreneur, I'm always looking to create, always looking for ideas. Um, uh, but we've been very blessed. It's been over 35 years in some way. So. And, you're, what's your and your project? Uh, well, I'm planning on doing a website for first time buyers, especially younger teens, 16 year olds that are getting their license for the first time. And it's going to be a website that's going to be a lot more simple than the websites that are now where they just give you um, a million information all listed on the table. It's very complicated to compare and contrast. It's going to be simple with um, very illustrated pictures, videos, graphs, charts. And we're just going to give you the top 10 cards and you know, maybe three categories, appearing, appearance, assurance, and affordability. And you can go from there. Nice. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to have people making the uh, am I ever worried about people taking my ideas? Uh, slightly. Uh, <laughs> yes. In, now, in certain cases, um, and with your ideas, you may find, and there are different ways to protect yourself legally. Um, I'm sure you guys talk about patenting, mm -hmm. copywriting, different ways of protecting whether it's intellectual property or whether it's a physical invention that you've done. You need to try to protect yourself. Um, so when you're talking to people about your idea, particularly when you're looking for investors, you want them to basically sign uh, a confidentiality agreement, number one, that they won't talk about this a lot to other people, and number two, that they won't take your idea and then run with it. So there are ways legally to protect it, but you just need to be smart about how you do it. You don't talk about it too much until you have those kinds of controls. Oh, wait. We have a project. Um, it's like a bracelet with the soldier's name on it. And it's metal, and it's like metal because they like, say like the, the soldiers are really strong. And it's like for charity. Awesome. Great. Um, what's one of the disadvantages of franchising that can be avoided uh, when just going on by yourself as one person? Okay. Um, and let me see if I'm answering this the right way. Um, not everyone is cut out for a franchise concept. By definition, an entrepreneur is someone who wants to create for themselves. In a franchise concept, you're an independent business person and an entrepreneur, bless you, in taking the tools that the franchise gives you and running with them. I just came from a franchisee, doesn't go out of his store, um, doesn't do the marketing, doesn't do despite the fact that he's got all these tools. Um, 
However, by definition, entrepreneur is someone who's doing this and creating this, so a franchise may be something that's too tight. It may close you into a box, as opposed to deciding that I want to take this on my own, I know what I'm doing, and I want to push that. Your project? Um, I have a website that, um, that brings teen, teenage volunteers to volunteering opportunities. It, it's like a matchmaking. Wow. Excellent. Excellent. What great concept. Mm -hmm. And how much of it is public uh, mm -hmm. for the benefit of the public? That is awesome. Do you own like a part of somewhere or do you own like a lot of the, you own a lot of stores that you franchise? No, I actually no longer own any stores. Um, I own the territory so that anyone who comes in to buy a subway or own a subway has to pay me a royalty. So I own Washington, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, the area, uh, the states, those four states, and now South Florida. So if you wanted a subway, you would have to meet with me or my staff. We would have to qualify you as someone we wanted to bring into the system, and then um, you would pay a franchise fee, which in our industry is very low. It's only a $15,000 franchise fee, and that gives you the right to be in Subway, and then an ongoing royalty fee. A royalty fee is 8%. It's an ongoing fee that you pay for the things that I listed, that support, the controls, all of those things on an ongoing basis. I, I, go ahead. Project? That's the... Oh, project. This is the computer. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah, he's yeah. well on his way. He's already I've got, I hired him for my mother. <laughs> She's getting a computer I'm, for Christmas. Everybody so loves that. I, idea. I, I'm hiring him. Um, I just want to say that for, for the benefit of all these kids out here, and you happen to mention Fred Smith. I don't know if you know. Do you know Fred? Yes. Okay. Uh, back in the 80s, when FedEx was just beginning, uh, when Fred knew everyone who worked for him, I worked for him. And so did my husband. My husband was the managing director of Manhattan. I was a senior quality analyst in Chicago. And when, when Mr. Feldman talked to all of you, and we, we went over numerous times that you have to have a passion for what you do. Fred Smith actually put gas for the planes, and he got right down to oh, my, having nothing on his credit card, Fred did. And he had his employees so wrapped up in this company and wanting to work there, we used to say that we bled purple because the colors were purple and orange for FedEx. It actually was Federal Express at the time. It wasn't even FedEx. It was Federal Express. And that we would say, oh, that we bleed purple. We believed so much in this company that we, I mean, we, we would do anything for Fred Smith, anything for that man, just because he had the passion, like you all do, and his passion rubbed off on all of us because he knew all of us by name practically because back then there were not very many employees and we loved it. I mean, we were, it was all consuming with us at the time. So when Joe has talked to you numerous times about it and Mr. Feldman has talked to you numerous times about it, you have to love what you're doing to carry through with your business. You gotta want it. You gotta really want it. And Labor he, of love. Yes, and by the way, he went to Yale, wrote a paper, and got on the Federal Express concept, got a C minus on his paper. So the professor said, it'll never work. Okay. Never work. I love I think the both of them could tell you how many times we were told that in, in, in our lives. Right. You know, so one of the things that I shared with them today. that we talk about is, you know, for me personally, and I'm sure it's the same with you, I've always been more afraid of, of not trying than I ever have of failing. And the failing and that scar tissue that you learn and just the fact that you keep moving forward and every, you know, failure you learn from and, and you, you change it a little bit to, to do better the next time. But with that, uh, I think I want all of you to uh, give a round of applause for Mr. Yeah. Yeah. You have one more question. One question, Harry. Harry. All right, Harry. Go ahead, Harry. Do you think if you didn't go to business school, you wouldn't be able to be a franchiser or not as good as a franchiser? Today? No, well, again, I switched out of business school and went to law school instead. Um, there are so many stories. Um, uh, you know, Fred DeLuca, uh, and the name of the company, parent of Subway, is Doctors Associates. He was going to get his doctorate in psychology. 
um, decided after being in business that he wanted to be in business. Um, you hear stories um, uh, of people at different levels of education. I think, um, much as Beth just said, you have an idea and you have the passion, um, that's a very significant part of that. The education, no question. You need it, you need to go to college, you need to, but love what you're studying. Love what you do. There's you know, an old quote about people living in uh, uh, quiet desperation. Is that they get up every day and they go to work and they do what they need to do and they kind of, next thing you know, I mean, it wasn't so long ago in my mind that I was your age and I was sitting in your chair. I can't tell you how quickly it goes. Love it. Think about it as that labor of love that we were talking about. Um, and just enjoy what you do. And Sandwich cookies. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll hand them out. Yeah, we'll hand them out. We're going to take a photo. We're going to take a little bit of a break. We usually give them a little bit of a break. Good luck, buddy. And then I'll just go with you. No, no. No, I know.